everybody. Reporting to you again from the Glamour City, Hollywood. I think that we have to recognize that we are in an existential crisis and that climate crisis demands adequate investment and we have the financial strength and the financial capability to do it. Like you say, we are facing obstacles in the political realm and in the realm of economic power because being such a wealthy industry making trillions of dollars, the fossil fuel industry wields tremendous political and economic power. And somehow we have to countervail that. And I think I, I would say there are maybe three or four major categories of problems like political problems, um, power and economics problems. There's a psychology problem. If you love listening to this show, please consider giving a rating and a review on Amazon Alexa or wherever you listen. We want to continue bringing you this amazing content, and part of our ability to do that means that we need a big audience. Now, it may not seem like much, but rating and reviewing the show will help more people find us, just like how you found this show. Simply on any podcast platform, search for a show, scroll down to the bottom, and push five stars. It's that easy. Thanks for supporting the show. Today, I'm joined by Dr. John J. Berger, an environmental science and policy specialist, journalist, and the author of Solving the Climate Crisis. Welcome to the show today. Thank you very much, Scott. I appreciate your invitation, and I'm looking forward to our conversation. You spent six years researching for your book, traveling the world, interviewing politicians, scientists, and many experts. And I have to ask you, and I know we're going to be talking about some of those big insights, but perhaps maybe a good starting point is things that perhaps maybe that challenge your original hypotheses or even ran counter to what you originally thought. Did I learn something, in other words, that um, countervails the main message that the climate crisis can be solved? Is that the essence of the question? Somewhat, somewhat, not necessarily, uh, but I'm sure you had some preconceived notions or certain assumptions as a researcher going into this. And as you're doing primary research, empirical research, there's got to be some data points where you said, hmm, I didn't consider that, or that runs counter to some of the assumptions that I made. I think what is counter to the assumptions that I've made um, is that the world is moving very rapidly towards worsening the climate crisis in some respects in that the united states is now the world's largest producer of oil the largest producer of natural gas the largest consumer of these um, products and we're also the third largest producer of coal now, I can remember back in the 1970s or so, or even beyond into the 90s, when the problem was the United States was importing half of its oil. So now we have a very robust fossil fuel industry, and the fossil fuel industry has a great deal of political and economic power. So even though I have confirmed my major hypothesis, which was that we do have essentially virtually all the technology that we need to have a very um, massive energy transformation to a reliance on clean renewable energy instead of reliance on fossil fuel. It's, um, it's gonna be difficult to do that because there is this momentum and this heavy dependence on fossil fuel in the United States, we're dependent on fossil fuel for about 79% of our energy. So there's this paradox, really, that we have all the technology we need, but A, we have not had the political will to implement it, and B, we are fighting the power of the fossil fuel industry, the multi-trillion dollars of investment that are going into its expansion and continuation well first of all I, I would say that the last 
several years has been just an incredible, profitable, really historically profitable for oil and gas. And some of these big publicly traded companies have recorded the highest, perhaps in the last 30 plus years. We have the Permian Basin that is very active with mergers and acquisitions. Things are growing. And to your point, we're producing and, and consuming more oil and gas than ever before. And of course, the justification, even under a Democratic president and Congress to some extent, is the fact that we've had high inflation and we don't want the consumers to feel the pain at the gas station. Hence, we need to produce more. But it's just been really very challenging to say the least, because I think the last five years has been so critical for the climate movement, but the data and the empirical evidence is running counter, isn't it? I think that if you take a short-term perspective, then you worry about pushing up prices at the gas pump and other short-term phenomena. But the thing that we have to keep in mind is that in this country, we are spending about a trillion dollars a year buying fossil fuels of all kinds, billions of tons of it, and then we're paying to uh, move it all around the country and spend energy to do that. The problem is that this it costs us a trillion dollars out of pocket and then maybe costs us a trillion dollars in all kinds of damages to the environment and to public health and to property through air pollution, worldwide air pollution, 90% of which is caused by fossil fuel, results in seven and a half million to eight million deaths, premature deaths and hundreds of millions of illnesses, plus untold environmental damage, plus it is propelling us towards a climate nightmare. So that's, that's kind of the big picture. And the problem is that there are uh, first costs, capital costs that are involved in transitioning to a clean energy economy. We have to pay for new systems of energy and replace the fossil fuel systems with them. The good news is that solar and wind power are a lot cheaper than new coal and new natural gas and new nuclear power. And that's why by 2025 or so, in other words, next year now, solar and wind will be the largest source of electricity in the world. Um, and we're investing vast amounts of it so that um, more than 50% of all the world's electricity will be solar and wind by 2027. And in California now, more than 50% of our electricity is produced by solar and wind. So we need to rapidly expand this transition, which is occurring in the electric power sector. And we need to, to implement it in the industrial sector, the transportation sector, and in the building sector. And we can do that with smart policies. What I'm, what I'm really saying is that once we make the transition, we are going to enjoy tremendous economic savings and a tremendous flux of new jobs, which we can produce by the clean energy transition and by modernizing our economy and our industry. In every sector of the economy, we have tremendous benefits to, to be harvested if we make this transition. And it's not only that we need to transition to 100% clean energy sources, namely solar, onshore wind, eventually offshore wind, uh, geothermal, hydropower, and battery storage, heat storage, uh, pumped storage using hydroelectricity. We can do this, and there are some countries that are already at 100% clean energy from wind, water, and solar in their electricity sectors, and they're moving towards cleaning up the other sectors. We can do this, we have the technology to do this, but we need the political will, and we need the realization that we are in a grave 
global climate emergency. And we have to have all hands on deck and all branches of government totally committing to make solving the climate crisis the number one priority for the nation. It is beyond any other crisis in its importance, not only for the moment, but for the future, because we are closely approaching some climate tipping points that could result in irreversible damage to the climate system that no amount of human intervention could later repair. So again, I, I'm in complete agreement. And as we've had many diverse guests on the show over the years, we've certainly in exhaustion have you know, gone through a lot of these different facets of what you're bringing up. So, so not not incredibly new, but I think from an energy perspective, you know, the levelized cost from an economic and financial standpoint, it just the justification is so so strong, so prominent that it's really more of a financial decision than even a climate decision for to some extent. But I want to start to maybe focus into specific sectors that, you know, I think we're going to cover. And let's start with the real estate sector, for instance. And what I'm interested in understanding are some of the nuances and the complexities and why it kind of gets stuck a little bit. So mm -hmm. we all know that buildings represent significant energy consumption, of course, carbon footprint. And you talk about things that can be done, especially incorporated into new building codes that will make certainly new buildings much more cost effective by using renewable energy, as well as new capabilities. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Buildings now use 70% of all of our electricity and 40% of our end use energy. So it's imperative that we um, make buildings as energy efficient as possible. And it's relatively easy to do that with stringent building codes for new buildings. But the big problem is that we have 111 million existing buildings. And these buildings are leaking energy like sieves. And it's uh, difficult to get the owners without financial incentives to upgrade the energy efficiency of these buildings because they pass on the utility costs to tenants and tenants come and go. So they themselves don't have proper incentives to make the energy efficiency upgrades. As a fellow that I write about in my book, Solving the Climate Crisis has explained, we need a new uh, energy financial structure to incentivize the rapid investment in deep energy efficiency throughout the building stock. And in each building, the, um, the requirements are a little bit different. In one building, you might have to replace the windows with uh, triple glazed energy efficient windows. Or in another building, you might have to replace the heating system. Uh, in another building, you might need to put more insulation into the walls, or maybe in another situation, you have to invest heavily in new um, electrical appliances where they're now using gas appliances. The reason why we wanna electrify, by the way, is, is because electricity in general is far, far more efficient for providing energy services than combustion, because there's a lot of waste energy in combustion that goes off as heat. So problem is we have this 111 million um, strong stock of energy inefficient buildings largely, and we have to provide incentives. And we also have to have a plan to go through these buildings um, rather quickly not over the next 50 years or 100 years, but we need to be addressing this problem by, you know, millions of buildings need to be worked on every year. And the good news is that there is money to be made, as Rob Harmon has pointed out, a very good rate of return if we treat energy efficiency savings as actually real energy and monetize those energy efficiency savings so that the more deep energy efficient efficiency um, 
retrofits you do, the more money you make. And I explain this is a little bit complicated, and I explained it in more detail in solving the climate crisis. But that's that's just one example. We need to also apply something known as a renewable portfolio standard, which is basically a requirement that every year you get a steadily increasing portion of all of your energy from clean renewable sources. We now have renewable portfolio standards in the electricity sector, but we need to apply that as Mark Jacobson has brilliantly pointed out in other sectors of the economy, in industry, in buildings, and in transportation. I'm not sure if I've fully wrestled with your question, but these are big questions and it's not easy to, to tangle with them. That's why I wrote a 528 page book. <laughs> yeah, okay. Th thank you. Thank you for that. Well, I think a uh, comment uh, and, and a bit of a question is on, certainly on the new buildings, there's a lot of opportunities where we can start to incorporate these new types of requirements into building codes across the country. I do have some questions around evidence of how that is rapidly being adopted and executed from a new uh, code uh, perspective. But as far as uh, the real issue around existing portfolio of older real estate that's out there is, to your point, you have a lot of property owners and managers and real estate trusts. And, you know, frankly, some of them are the stingiest people in the world. And to compound what you're talking about from a problem perspective is that many of them are having to actually walk away from some of these prize buildings because of high interest rate and their inability to refinance their debt. So to that point, and you start to kind of go into it, and again, I know that we don't have enough time, but talk a little bit about carbon credits and how that can provide another revenue stream and, and an incentive for these building owners and managers where they are incented to want to consider updating and retrofitting their buildings? Well, I think that what we need is public private finance, because in this country, we have something, we have trillions of dollars of capital sitting on the sidelines, not involved in the clean energy transition. And if government, for example, provides low interest financing or loan guarantees, they can, by paying down the differential between the market rate and what makes an investment in a renewable building or a building renovation profitable, then we can lure or incentivize this private capital into the enterprise of converting buildings. I'm not getting into the weeds of all of the technicalities of what's known as metered energy efficiency transaction structures. But for other people who are really interested in real estate, they can find all the details in solving the climate crisis. But meanwhile, there's these simple things that we could actually do, like we could have a national clean energy bank that would focus on making clean energy transition loans that would get, I, I hope, hundreds of billions of dollars actively engaged in the clean energy transition. We should have at least $500 billion going into this every year in this country. And as I pointed out earlier in our conversation, we would be saving a trillion dollars on not buying fossil fuels ultimately. And globally, as Professor Mark Jacobson points out, we would be able to have a, tr a complete transition in 145 countries that provide 90, that use 99% of the world's energy. We could do that ultimately for $62 trillion, but it would provide us by 2050 with about $11 trillion a year in savings. So we would pay back that cost in five to six years. And ultimately, we would be earning far more, an estimated $18 trillion per year in energy savings on a global basis. But going back to the United States, I mentioned a clean energy bank. I think we also ought to be raising money with clean energy treasury bonds. And all of this, the building sector, the industrial sector, the transportation and electricity sector should be 
encompassed or guided by a national uh, climate action plan because this is too important to address on a helter skelter piecemeal basis with every city and every town and every state having sometimes conflicting regulations. If you look at the Bullet Center, by the way, in Seattle, which I write about in some detail in solving the climate crisis, it shows that you can have a multi-story downtown office building in Seattle, the cloudiest city in the United States, and you can still generate all the electricity and then some that the building uses, and you can provide for all of its own water and treat its own sewage and um, use construction practices that cause the building to, to endure for 200 years. All of these things are possible. Can, the building materials can be non-toxic. And the proof is the bullet center that was created by Dennis Hayes, who was the founder of Earth Day, along with Senator Gaylord Nelson. So we can do this. There are examples. There's living proof in the form of these living buildings. The other neat thing about the bullet center is that the external skin, if you will, or, sh or shell of the building is like the skin of an organism. The building responds to its environment. There are sensors that not only detect temperature, but wind speed, and everything is kind of automatically adjusted and computer controlled. And, and you have a minimum energy demand, just like I think seven, if I'm remembering correctly, 17% of the energy demand of a conventional building. And these buildings ultimately don't cost a lot more. Maybe they cost less ultimately than conventional buildings. Because let me give you one quick example. Mark Jacobson, for example, the professor I mentioned, his house is completely uh, renewably powered and he doesn't have um, a gas furnace. So he saved thousands of dollars not installing gas lines to the house and so on. So the, the clean energy infrastructure ultimately is going to be far, far cheaper to operate because we are not using fuel and setting it on fire every you know hour of the day. The fuel for an electri electrically powered economy comes from the sun and the wind and from the, the heat of the earth in terms of geothermal power. And um, that fuel is free. So all you have to do is put in the right capital infrastructure, which is the first cost that I was talking about earlier. And once you've done that, then you're on easy street and you're starting to save money. And overall, you make a lot of money. Plus, you have all of the jobs that result from converting the economy. More than 3 million Americans are already working in the clean energy economy. So again, I, I'm in full agreement, and I, I think um, it all makes sense, but I believe that a lot of your assertion really hinges upon this private public sector with a lot of fiscally oriented types of policies, and including a little bit of monetary, because you mentioned even treasury, treasury bonds as well. But the thing is, um, and again, we recognize that the Inflation Reduction Act was a very limited vehicle. There's only so much that a concession-based policy is going to have an impact. But yet, some of that was meant to be done through uh, the IRA. But yet, I think the bigger question at hand is, from a policy and from a treasury perspective, is this even feasible given the fact that we're facing an existential crisis, certainly in the U.S., because of the fact that we have this out of control national debt. And at this point, it's somewhat of a common knowledge that because our Congress's inability to address some of the major entitlement programs, the good faith, the, the thing that we trust when it comes to the U.S. and the U.S.'s ability to repay its debts uh, is starting to really weaken. And at some point, I think there's enough very smart and institutional people that are out there are starting to be very concerned about a financial meltdown because nations are not going to want to hold our treasuries or they're going to demand much higher yield, leading to hyperinflation and loss in value of our monies. So 
And and again, it's this is uh, we're seeing evidence because so much is going into gold and silver and Bitcoin because for this fair reason. So is it really possible that that we can actually ask for more tax credits, more loans, more grants from the government? And yes, it is. And I'm just trying to figure out, you know, the feasibility, both politically, especially given the fact that we're in this election year, and there's this really almost like an incredulous scenario where Donald Trump is going to become president again. And where all the work that you're talking about potentially could go right in the toilet as he cuddles back to oil and gas industries to fan his pockets. There are unquestionably tremendous obstacles to implementing the clean transition in the United States. And you've alluded to or stipulated to a number of them. And certainly I cannot wave a magic wand and eliminate gridlock in Congress. Only the American people can really do that. But the public, if it's engaged, if it is knowledgeable, if it understands the problem, can demand solutions and can demand action. Um, we also are the strongest nation in the world financially. <clears throat> Excuse me. And when we decide to do something, even if it's something quite counterproductive, we can produce trillions of dollars to do it. Uh, for example, we spent $8 trillion of taxpayers' money on the fairly recent wars of choice in Iraq and Syria and Afghanistan. And we achieved very little for that investment, but we did help destabilize the Middle East and cause the injury and displacement and death of millions of people. We also found somehow miraculously trillions of dollars of taxpayer dollars to address the great recession of 2007 and 2008 and again in response to the covid pandemic these are extraordinarily serious crises that required lots of federal money but i don't think you could make that argument that donald trump's tax cuts for the wealthy met that or rose to that standard. So I think that we have to recognize that we are in an existential crisis and that climate crisis demands adequate investment and we have the financial strength and the financial capability to do it. Like you say, we are facing obstacles in the political realm and in the realm of economic power because being such a wealthy industry making trillions of dollars, the fossil fuel industry wields tremendous political and economic power. And somehow we have to countervail that. And I think I, I would say there are maybe three or four major categories of problems like political problems, um, power and economics problems. There's a psychology problem because people do not truly understand the nature of an existential threat that is over the horizon. People understand when they stub their toe, but they don't understand that somewhere down the line, your foot is going to get cut off. Um, they don't understand also the, the um, to some extent, the science of what's going on. There was a study in 2012 by the National Science Foundation, and it showed that a quarter of Americans still believe the sun revolves around the earth. That's science that was settled by Copernicus 500 years ago. And maybe three quarters of the American people don't know what the composition of the atmosphere is or what carbon dioxide is. So it's hard for them to understand half the people don't think that humans are causing climate change. They see the climate is changing, have trouble understanding what the difference is between climate and weather. So there's a tremendous educational challenge ahead. We know what the policies are. We know what we have to do. We have to stop subsidizing all fossil fuels. We talk about, you raise the issue of, of money and solvency. Well, the International Monetary Fund has shown that we spend on average about $7 trillion a year globally subsidizing the fossil fuel industry and something like $646 billion in the United States 
with implicit and explicit subsidies to the fossil fuel industry. If you want, um, stop that subsidization and turn that money around. Don't you don't necessarily need to come up with new sources of money or new sources of death. Just stop misusing the money that we already have that the taxpayers have provided to the government and focus those financial resources on a rapid um, clean energy transition. So we stop all fossil fuel subsidies. We have to have a moratorium on new fossil fuel development. We should have an international fossil fuel non-proliferation treaty. We need to issue a national climate emergency declaration because this is an emergency like no other hu emergency that human beings have ever encountered. And we could create a disaster of unimaginable proportions if we continue on this path of increasing the power, the strength, the profits of the fossil fuel industry and allow them to drive our, our civilization over a climate cliff. We are now pedal to the metal in terms of our foot on the gas pedal and we're hurtling towards a climate cliff. We're in the dark. We don't know where that climate cliff is, but there are climate tipping points in the climate system. And we know that we are damn near close to crossing them. So we have, in effect, we're in a situation where the world is on fire, our house is on fire. Instead of breaking the glass and pulling the alarm and training, you know, gushers of water on the flames, we're throwing gasoline on the flames and we're expecting the fire to go out. And that is not going to work. So one of the things that our program has really focused on over the years is instead of saying they and they could be politicians governments or different entities we really try to focus the, the narrative around we what can we as individuals mm -hmm. and citizens and and people that are voting for these people in positions of power and influence yes and one of the things you talk about again we're out of time for today but is being very thoughtful about big purchases but i think the other thing is really holding our elected officials accountable. And yes. specifically, you know, I'm talking to those that are independents and those that are moderate Republicans. Um, I think it's wrong for us to put a canvas blanket over certain types of ideology, but rather I think there are smart people that understand that the crisis that we're facing today. So we really need to make sure that the people, the power base, really try to elect the right people that can actually represent them to do exactly the kind of collective action that's needed to make this happen. So with that, I have been joined by Dr. John Berger, the author of Solving the Climate Crisis. Thanks for joining today. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. If you've enjoyed this episode, take a moment to rate our show on any podcast platform that you listen to. Scroll down to the bottom and push five stars. It's that easy. And as always, thanks for listening.